Hello, welcome to Insight. I'm Wendy Brokaw. The Willamette Humane Society has just begun its merger process with the Oregon Humane Society. It officially began on July 1st and will take about 24 months to complete. But what does this mean for Salem area residents? And how does this merger affect and benefit both organizations going forward. Would you please welcome our guest, B.J. Anderson, to the Executive Director of the Willamette Humane Society, and Laura Klink, Oregon Humane Society Media Relations and Communications Director. B.J., I'm so glad to see you again. First, I have a couple of quick questions for you because I know both of your organizations are deeply dedicated to animal welfare. What's happening? <laughs> Well, um, Willamette Humane Society has officially merged with Oregon Humane Society, and we are now the Salem campus of the Oregon Humane Society. Really exciting. That happened on July 1st, and we are now deep in the integration uh, phase. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, what led to this decision? Um, well, we spent... Um, over two years, uh, really um, diving deep into this. It started, um, it started with me seeing a presentation at a National Animal Welfare Leadership Conference uh, in 2017 and knowing that this was the best future for the organization and kind of just putting it in the back of my mind. Um, and then our board really doubled down on it in uh, 2019. Um, we were looking at... Um, the, the wicked problem we had between wanting to do more for our community and needing to have a sustainable business model in order to do that. Um, and when we took a deep dive into it, we realized that we couldn't do everything we wanted to do for the community and sustain um, the organization for the, long, for the long term. We weren't in any kind of immediate crisis, but we were looking for long-term stability for the community for animal welfare. And um, the conclusion that the board and I came to was that the best option was going to be consolidation of resources and merging, um, and that the best and really only partner in Oregon uh, for us was going to be Oregon Humane Society. So then began the long, long process of comparing, consulting, talking, sharing, all the stuff that happens in the background before you get to talk about it. <laughs> um, you know, the due diligence for both organizations to know that this was the, the best thing for both organizations going forward. I have to ask, are you going to be keeping your name? Nope, we're gonna be the Salem campus of the Oregon Humane Society. So we are officially part of that organization. And we're, we're really thrilled to join an organization like Oregon Humane Society that's got such a solid reputation in the state. They've been around for so long um, and they're nationally recognized as leaders in animal welfare. So we want to be part of that. <laughs> and now I understand why. Did the pandemic affect your services and how? Sure. Uh, it affected services in animal welfare across the country. Um, you know, across the country, we all had to shut down our hospital surgery programs uh, for a while. Um, all of the medical supplies and equipment needed to go to um, the pandemic response. Um, and, and we're experiencing the effects of that now. Everybody is seeing, um, you know, we've had an exponential rise in cats uh, in the community because we had to stop doing those surgeries for a while. Give us an example of just how many surgeries you've been doing since you opened the spay neuter clinic there uh, on Turner Road in 2010. Uh, yeah, we opened in 2010. Uh, since then, we've done over 65,000 spay and neuter surgeries. Um, that's both on uh, animals that the shelter owned for a period of time and mostly for community animals. And most of those are cats. Um, for the last several years, we've actually been doing just cats for the community because the need has been um, more than we can accommodate <laughs> um, and still is. Um, there still is more out there. What's going to be happening at the shelter during this period? Will your services change? 
we're not expecting services to change. The way we provide them will be adjusting to be um, coherent across both campuses, um, but it's going to take some time. Uh, it's probably going to take, you know, a year, year and a half for us. Every one of the um, support systems, the background, the databases, uh, each of our organizations ran on different databases. So if you start thinking about that, you've got, you know, your animal management software, your clinic management, your volunteer management, your donor development management, your, you know, all of your systems, uh, Microsoft, Google. You know, like, so we've been in the process of aligning those. Our websites uh, will need to be uh, aligned into one ultimately, but you can't do that overnight. Um, so we needed to just, you know, make the start. Um, uh, and, and now we do the work of, of bringing those things together. Well, thank you, BJ. Laura, tell us about the Oregon Humane Society. It is, has a long history. <laughs> Absolutely. The Oregon Humane Society was founded in 1868. So about 153 years of serving pets and people across Oregon. And when we looked at this merger, Willamette Humane Society had such a strong presence in the Mid Valley with a, a 50 year history. So we like to look at this as combined. We bring over 200 years of um, experience to the table of caring for pets and the people who love them across Oregon. So Oregon Humane Society was founded as a um, as an organization to fight animal cruelty um, with the working horses in this community. And so that remains one of the core uh, programs and, and a core part of our mission is uh, fighting animal cruelty and neglect. And over the years, we've uh, obviously moved into pet adoption. We have a really robust humane education program, as does um, the Salem campus. We've got camp happening for kids at both campuses. Um, our medical services here. Um, BJ talked a little bit about the spay-neuter clinic at the Salem campus. Here at the Portland campus, we have a spay-and-save program that helps folks in the community. And again, it's been really focused on cats the last uh, two years. We're still working through a backlog of, of need for spay-neuter services here in the Portland area. Uh, training and behavior programs. Um, so over you know the course of 153 years, the programs here in the Portland area have grown and changed and how we work with areas around the state has really grown and changed over the years. Our second chance program, we work with shelter partners all over the state of Oregon. And for many years, we partnered with Willamette Humane Society. And that really was is a program that helps move animals uh, from one shelter to another where there may be a higher um, demand for adoptable pets. Um, during the pandemic, you know, BJ talked a little bit about some of the challenges that our communities we're facing during the height of the pandemic. We know that cost of care and even cost of supplies can be very challenging uh, for pet owners. So I would say a couple months into 2020, we launched an effort to deliver pet food to um, human, you know, food pantries that, that people use to, to get you know, human food, um, and then to shelters around the state. And I think we hit almost every single county around Oregon. So, you know, we are the Oregon Humane Society. We look at how we can really service this state and certainly being part of the Mid-Valley community is a really important at this next um, phase of our, our organization. What will happen to the animals at what used to be called the Willamette Humane Society out there on Turner Road? Yeah, um, we're really uh, pretty excited about what we're gonna be able to do for the animals because of many of the things that Laura just mentioned, uh, having access to the medical resources in Portland and also having access to the adoption uh, options. Um, it'll allow us to move pets up and down uh, the valley <laughs> Um, to where they're going to be able to find homes faster. So I, I expect it's going to be decreasing the length of stay, particularly for dogs in our care by having a wider um, audience <laughs> um, and to be able to access uh, medical services for some of our complicated cases. One of the things that we're seeing in animal welfare is an increase in um, both complicated behavior uh, cases and complicated medical cases. Uh, the animals that are coming into us are older, they may have more issues, 
we have the resources together to do for those animals what their owners may not have been able to do. Um, and then another area that we're really excited about focusing on and that Oregon Humane Society has really taken the lead on uh, is access to care for the community who have not been able to access veterinary services for their pets. So that's been something that was very evident in the pandemic. Uh, none of us could get new pet exams. <laughs> we couldn't find a vet who was taking clients let alone a vet that we could necessarily afford. So um, having the new Road Ahead campaign or the project that's opening up in Portland um, is a huge uh, asset to the state um, and to the, to the area. That's a, I'm sure Laura's gonna be more eloquent, but the, uh, the new Road Ahead is opening a community vet hospital that is for the public particularly uh, a way to assist people who've had difficulty accessing veterinary services for their pets. Very Laura, exciting. Laura, you're she was talking about OHS's new Road Ahead project. I looked at your website. That looks really extensive uh, and very exciting. Tell us about what she's talking about. Sure, the New Road Ahead project is a $36 million construction project um, that includes two buildings that are um, an expansion of our, our current campus here up on Northeast Columbia Boulevard in Portland. Um, one building will house the community veterinary hospital, so that will provide uh, low and subsidized veterinary care for owned pets in the community. Uh, the second floor of that building will um, house a uh, Animal Crimes Forensic Center. And so I can talk a little bit about our humane law enforcement work and how having a dedicated space for that forensic work is going to make a huge difference in seeking justice and accountability for, for abused animals. Um, a second building, which I'm really excited about, is the Behavior and Rescue Center. And BJ talked a little bit about seeing animals with more complex behavior needs. Currently here at the Portland Shelter, we have a behavior modification program where our trainers work with animals who are, you know, having some, maybe they've suffered from trauma, from being in abuse or neglect situation. Um, currently, we have a lot of dogs in the program that are very, very rambunctious. So they're learning how to settle and, and um, learn some manners so they can go on to be wonderful pets for folks. But doing that in our current shelter, our current busy shelter is just not conducive for the type of learning and healing that some of these animals need. And so as one Oregon Humane Society with a Portland and a Salem campus, animals that maybe come into our Salem campus that are really having a difficult time that can benefit from the expertise of our, our training staff who are specifically working with animals with these sort of higher level needs. They can maybe perhaps move up to the Portland campus to that, that behavior and rescue center um, to get the care that they need. The other thing that that building will do is give us a place for animals that may come from large um, rescues, whether it's a hoarding situation or an abuse situation or a puppy mill situation, those animals will have a dedicated space to go. The other areas we've seen across the state, especially in 2020, that wildfires are increasingly becoming a big threat to some of our more densely populated areas. And so across the board, I think there have been big strides made in terms of having co-housing locations for people and their pets at evacuation sites. But we know that that won't necessarily you know, solve all the needs during a, a big natural disaster. So for example, during the wildfires in 2020, Oregon Humane Society works with shelters all over the state. So the, um, the shelter in Newport needed to evacuate their animals that were in the shelter. So they had a facility to help with either stray or emergency boarding in their local area. So again, having that dedicated space where during a natural disaster, we can move animals into is going to be a huge benefit to the entire state, really. What you just call the humane law enforcement, will that be coming to Salem? 
Absolutely. So we, our officers are commissioned by the Oregon State Police to enforce animal cruelty and neglect laws anywhere around the state. And oftentimes that looks like partnering with local law enforcement that may not have the expertise or the skills to really deal with some of these cases. And you may remember back in 2018, there was a case in the Salem area with about 35 cats that had been locked in a U-Haul, unfortunately. Some, several of them were deceased. Willamette Humane Society was a first responder basically in that particular situation. The cats all went to, to that um, campus in Salem. Um, some of the more medically fragile cats came up here to Portland to get some advanced medical care. And then our humane law enforcement team here was able to you know, collect evidence that was ultimately used in the case. So those are the, the types of ways that our humane law enforcement team will continue to work around the state. And of course, with a stronger presence in the Mid Valley, we'll be able to do even more for animals and to assist agencies in that area. You talked yeah, about- Wendy, that was, a, yeah. that was a really key uh, element for us as well in seeking out uh, the partnership with Oregon Humane Society. Um, I've sat on a, um, a task force in Marion County around uh, trying to find ways to more effectively address uh, neglect and cruelty. And, and on that task force, we had the Marion County Dog Control, but more importantly, it was the sheriff, it was the police departments from all the different jurisdictions, representatives from all of those uh, in Marion County looking at um, how do we more effectively and consistently address the complaints that are coming in. And one of the key things that we kept coming back to is you know, can we get Oregon Humane Society to have a more solid presence in the Mid Valley? And yes, yes, we can, but I can't talk about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, we're really excited to have that, uh, that element of the partnership uh, coming into a, um, to the Mid Valley. You mentioned puppy mills or cat mills, of mills of all kinds. What are you talking about, Laura, when it comes to cruelty and these mills? So it's interesting, we haven't seen these cases pop up as much in Portland. And what was top of mind for me was a situation in Modesto, California, where there were about 150 French bulldogs and other bulldog mixes that were um, seized in a case, uh, I think about two months ago. And Stanislaw Animal Services down in California were caring for, you know, 150 extra animals in addition to providing their regular services. So Oregon Humane Society Second Chance Program, um, you know, we were one of the organizations that already partners with Stanislaw Animal Services, and they said, hey, can you guys take 40 to 50 of these dogs? And they were working with rescues, other rescues around the country, especially ones that have some expertise with this specific breed. Um, and I was really proud of our Second Chance team that, you know, French Bulldogs have their little squishy faces. They, you know, sometimes their breathing, you know, can, can be challenging and things like that. And these animals had really been through a lot. And our second chance team to, uh, took two trips down to Modesto, California to pick up some of these dogs and took, you know, they always take amazing care of these animals during these, you know, 10 to 12 hour uh, road trips. But uh, Perla, our second chance uh, coordinator and driver, she stopped very frequently to check the air conditioning, make sh making sure everything was, was, uh, was a okay for these animals. And that was, that was something here that I think we all just took a lot of, lot of pride in that, that our team, just especially these animals that have been through so much, whether they're part of a hoarding case or a neglect case or abuse case, you know, our teams now across both campuses uh, will be able to provide just an extraordinary level of care for these animals that have been through a lot. And, you know, having been down to the Salem campus, I mean, I see how much love and care the team down there gives these animals. And so now it's, it's really exciting for us to now work as one team together. 
So you enjoy working with the team now that you've gotten to know them down there. They're pretty good people, right? <laughs> They're amazing. And I've been really fortunate to work with BJ through, you know, this, this process of figuring out, you know, how do we educate this community, the communities in both areas about what this means for pets and people. Um, you know, it's just, it's been just such a pleasure to work with BJ. She brings such a depth of knowledge about um, animal welfare and then also about the Mid Valley community. I think those of us who are up here primarily based at the Portland campus are really excited to learn about the, the needs and the opportunities in the Salem community. A, a person from my team is at the thrift store today, um, you know, partnering with the folks that run the thrift store. So we're, you know, just really thrilled, um, you know, about this, this, the, what, what might lie ahead and, and the opportunities and the opportunities you know, just the chance to be a larger family. I mean, it, it is really exciting. And I just, on a personal note, have just really enjoyed working with BJ as we've kind of navigated this. You know, it sounds, you know, it sounds like a great idea. You know, so, sometimes things sound like a great idea, but then you have to start digging into the details. And like BJ talked about, just like, then you start discussing things and what is this going to look like? And now as we move through this next phase of integrating our software platforms and figuring out adoption processes and align, aligning a lot of those things, Things, um, it's just great to have have partners to to help uh, go through this next chapter together. And BJ, do you think this is going to help people who are in the heartbreaking position of having to surrender an animal because they can't care for it, or don't know how to care for it, or don't have the funds to take care of, of it? Sure. Um, I mean, I think we've been. Um, approaching those situations differently already for the past several years. We've been um, very conversational with those folks to see if there's ways that we can work with them to keep the pets in the home they already have with the people who already love them. So on a case-by-case -case basis, we've been working with people to maybe provide the emergency veterinary care that they need and then put the dog or that cat back in the home that they already had so that we don't tie up space in our shelter for pets who really don't have anyone. Um, and it's so important to support the, the bond between pets and their people. Uh, it's a, and it's a real shift that's happened in animal welfare to understand, you know, we're both the advocates and then we also had to come on board with the concept, you know, like, we advocate for the beauty of, of the bond and the love that happens between pets and people. And we talk about it a lot when we talk about adoption, where we've had to like get on board and educate the public and ourselves is it's not necessary to remove an animal because the family is in crisis. If there are ways that we can support that family, that person to keep the pets with them, that's actually going to help those people survive the, whatever crisis they're dealing with, whether it's a natural disaster crisis or a personal crisis. Pets are actually a protective factor in social service situations. So we've really come around to seeing how we can do more to keep people and their pets together. That is also one of the things that the board looked at. We wanna do more of that. That was one of the factors of like, we don't wanna do less in the community. We wanna do more in the community. And that was one of the driving factors uh, the leading us to this merger um, was the ability to expand that level of service. Animals, people, communications. It's quite extraordinary. People discover that the longer they get to know their pet, and uh, the pet gets to know them. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I think there's something Laura talked about that I'd really like to amplify um, and, and kind of add my own uh, element. She's talked about how she's enjoyed working with the, or with the, with the Willamette Humane Society team uh, in this process. Um, it's been the same from our side. Um, and, and one of the things that I wanna make really clear to people, I think it's very easy for people to assume that Oregon Humane as the larger, more well-resourced, older organization uh, has come in and acquired, you know, you have that like 1980s 
finance movie of idea of mergers and acquisitions, or people might have been through M and A with their own companies in the for profit world. Um, that is not what happened here. Um, this was positive and collaborative from the start. This was our idea uh, from Salem to reach out and um, and invite Oregon Humane Society to this to this merger. Um, there was nothing hostile in this process. <laughs> um, and the team has been incredibly um, just great to work with through the process. It's a very complicated process. Um, it's complicated legally. It's complicated interpersonally. It's complicated in every level. I mean, you're changing everything and trying not to change anything too much. <laughs> uh, so... It's really complicated, and I I will reflect on the um, the person that Oregon Humane Society hired to help us help the team uh, lead through this program. The consultant that they hired um, was so complimentary when she started working with the team about how far ahead we were uh, because of how we already were collaborating. We already were on the same page. We already wanted each other to be successful. Um, and I've just, I mean, I've worked with Sharon Harmon, the president and CEO of Oregon Humane Society for years. We've been colleagues and we've worked together and we've known each other and been friends. So that was easy. But then meeting the whole rest of her team as I have through this process, there's such a good, um, rich blending. Um, the cultures are not that different. Yes, it's Portland. Yes, it's Salem. But the quality and passion and talent and dedication of the employees on the two teams are very much the same. And it's a joy to work with the, with the new team. Laura, that's a wonderful, optimistic outlook for your futures together in this merger. As a matter of fact, how can people keep track of what's going on, what stage you're in? Uh, how do they keep track? So we are absolutely committed to, to transparency and open communication and feedback as we move through this process. Um, you know, now we're really diving into the details, um, you know, adoption process, admissions process, you know, sharing of resources across the campus. Um, so through our social media channels, through our website, um, our email communication, our quarterly magazine will be providing the public with regular updates. And, you know, again, just getting questions and feedback from the public has really been helpful as we've tried to figure out, you know, what, what do people really want to know about? Where do people have questions? And so that open line of communication is really important to us as we, as we move through this phase. Let's give them a starting point. What is your website? Thank you. Uh, that, that would be helpful. Uh, OregonHumane.org is our website. Um, and we are in the process of merging our two websites. Um, so right now we still are operating two websites, but soon uh, in the next two months or so, we'll have one website. And what will be really helpful when we move to that one website, we know that people will drive an hour, two hours, three hours to find the right pet. And so now by having one website, people can look at animals from both campuses. And so someone who lives in like Wilsonville, I mean, they're halfway between Portland and Salem. Um, so, you know, maybe there is an animal that they're interested in meeting that's at the Salem campus. So I think that that's one of the, the things I'm really excited about. You asked about kind of communication through the process, but, you know, our website is going to be such an important tool to keep people informed and help even more pets find homes. Well, this is an exciting venture, and I wish you a great deal of luck and success going forward. We'll keep in touch with you, keep it updated with you on Insight to find out how's it going, and um, look forward to seeing you again. B.J. Anderson, Executive Director of what used to be the Willamette Humane Society, and Laura Klink, who is the Communications Manager for the Oregon Humane Society. Thank you so much for joining us today on Insight. I'm Wendy Brokaw. Thanks for having us, Wendy. Thank you.